I fundamentally now believe that if you put together a advertising-based business model with all-knowing technology that can stitch together the most riveting feed of content that will trigger every single base emotion that you have and keep you coming back for more. If you pair those things with the advertising business model, you end up in a bad place because you end up with a service that will keep taking and taking and taking and ultimately manipulating and manipulating and manipulating until we're at war with each other. This is Startup to Storefront. Today's guest is Tim Kendall, former director of monetization at Facebook, former president of Pinterest, and the current CEO of Moment, an app designed to help you develop a healthier relationship with your phone and the amount of time you spend on it. And in case you're wondering, he is all too aware of the irony. It's this kind of resume that also made Tim stand out to the producers of a much talked about documentary, The Social Dilemma, where he lends his industry insight into how tech companies are manipulating and controlling us through social media platforms. If you've thought as much without having seen the documentary, the problem is probably worse than you'd imagine. So listen in as we cover everything from the downside of trying to optimize your work-life balance, why Tim predicts that the inevitable end of social media will leave us at war with one another, and perhaps most importantly, how to gain back control over your phone. Now, back to the episode. All right, guys, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we have Tim Kendall, founder and CEO of Moment. Tell us a little bit about what are you, what are you working on? Yeah, you know, one of the ways that I like to explain what Moment does is we, we want to help people get out of their own way. So, you know, I think in my own life, I've seen how I can definitely get in my own way in terms of being on my phone for too long, uh, eating too much sugar, drinking too much coffee. Um, and so we think there's a really interesting opportunity I mean, we think that in a phrase, people have lost control of their phones and mm. how they use their phones. And so we are building different apps and experiences that we believe will help people take uh, control again of, uh, of how they use their phones. And, and what we find is that, you know, when people do get control back over their phones, they're happier, they're more grounded, they're more present and their relationships are better. And obviously this is a bit of a can of worms, but we've all seen the movie, The Social Dilemma is like trending everywhere. And so what, let's talk a little bit about going back to what made you want to start the company. What sure. was the aha moment for you? Yeah. So I have two girls. I have a six-year-old and a, and a four-year-old. And when my six-year-old uh, Taya was born, I started to really notice in a pronounced way that my phone was just drawing all of my attention. Mm. And I would find myself, you know, I'd be trying to parent and I would kind of sneak off into the guest room or sneak off into the bathroom or sneak into the pantry and steal some time to kind of get a hit of mm -hmm. my phone. And that could have been a frivolous scroll through, through Instagram. It could be a silly video that someone sent me. But I think what I started to notice was, to my earlier point, I was getting in my own way. What I was getting in the way of was my aspiration of being a really present, engaged dad. Look, admittedly, at, at, a, at a few months old, like, what's the big deal? Sure. You know, probably, probably a fair point. But I thought it, what, what scared me was that I thought it was a precursor to how I was going to be later, which was just this absent, mm. absent dad. And so it really was a, a wake up call for me. And I started to just look a lot more deeply about why it was that these things sucked so much of our time and attention from us. And, uh, and I, I believed that there potentially was an opportunity to really help people mm -hmm. get out of their own way in terms of, you know, staring at this piece of glass for way longer than they want to every day. Um, and I thought that there might be a business there too. One of the things I always think about is, so before I got into tech, it was like, um, I'll call myself a decently efficient human. And then I got into tech and all of a sudden I was wanting to figure out 
exactly what to put in my body, right? To just get the most out of my day, working seven to 10, making sure I wasn't sluggish during any investor meeting or during, yeah. even with your employees, right? Hiring a team and all these things. And it was the first time an Apple Watch came out. And I remember meeting Keith Robois and he had it first. He had it like the day, and I was like, ah, he's got, you know, we had a meeting with him and he had it the day before it came out, of course. And I just remember getting one and thinking, this is it. Like I've hit, I've hit the human efficiency limit, right? Now I don't need to even think I can, I know that there's a Zoom happening. I know I have a meeting in this conference room and I kind of want to break this discussion into how you see this for, for somebody like yourself, like me, who was super focused on just productivity to then just your normal person who's just trying to get through their day and probably doing a little bit more with the content as it relates to like watching fun videos or just, just engaging in content, liking a bunch of stuff and then to the creators. But we'll start with the tech piece of it. I think this is something that I had to realize where I was, I was going to bed at 11.08, Tim, to the dot, like 11.08 to the, and my wife mid conversation, it wouldn't matter what I was doing. Okay. Mid conversation, it was 1108. I'm out. And by the way, I was on my laptop. So as soon as I saw 1108, I'd close it down. Yeah. And I, would, I was like, what's happening? And I didn't think what's happening to me until years later. So was that kind of the genesis a little bit for you too, where you were just so hyper-focused on maybe efficiency at the beginning, as opposed to just consuming content? Yeah. I mean, I think there was, I think there definitely was a I was telling myself this story that having email and text messaging in my pocket allowed me to keep tabs on, you know, work at Pinterest and mm. be present with my family. Right. I thought you could, I, 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 I believed I could really multitask uh, in, yeah. in, that, in that regard. Right. And I could be, mm. Oh, I could be super dad and super husband and I can be the president of Pinterest. No problem. Right. And, and I think that, I think that's a, that's a farce. Like I, I just, I, I, I believe that, you know, and I think this is true at, at uh, in, in the, in the reverse, which is that part of my experience in being a dad of young kids and having a, a relatively intense job as, as president of Pinterest was when I was at home, I felt like I needed to be at work. And when I was at work, I actually sometimes very, actually frequently thought, oh, I should be at home with my kids. I never could find kind of equanimity in being right here and now, mm. right? There was always this obsession with when is this meeting going to be over with and the next meeting is going to start. Like okay. it was always this, this fascination and, and hook into what was happening next, how much faster could now get over with. Right. And that just felt like a, intuitively, it just started to feel like that was a shitty way to live. That makes sense. I, I kind of deconstruct this in two ways. So obviously I, you were at Facebook at one time and I think the whole goal is just stay on the platform, right? Make it simple, like stay on the platform. At Pinterest, I kind of view it a little differently where I think Pinterest was built in the sense of like, like you're, you're picking things out for your wedding or your DIY home project. And so the whole goal there is get inspo and then go do the thing that the inspo was about. Yep. Right. And That's I right. thought that was such an interesting paradigm to me. It was like, Oh, this makes a lot of sense. It's like, it, it doesn't want you actually in the platform. hundred percent. And so I guess this, this makes the question even more obvious. <laughs> was, that, was that how you were thinking about it? I would imagine too. And, and yeah, the definitely how I was thinking about Pinterest when I was there and, and I don't, you know, I have a real bone to pick with social media companies right now. I don't think of Pinterest as a social media company. I would agree with for, that. Yeah. For the reason that you just uh, yeah. explained, you know, we, we never had a goal there around maximizing you know, Diego's time spent. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas at a place like YouTube, that is expressly the top level goal, aggregate hours on the platform of all the users. And how do we make that grow as fast as possible? Right. And so then your, your objectives and what you build and how the, how the product feels to users is very different. And look, the outcomes are different. 
Sure. I would be, I mean, I haven't done the study on the, the incidence of, of depression or anxiety linked to Pinterest. I'm sure it's not zero, but I'm sure it's, you know, is dwarfed by what a Facebook and a YouTube does in terms of impact on, on state of well-being and mental health. The, the issue I have personally is that I've never looked at social media as something for me. I've always looked at it through the lens of an entrepreneur. And so I had started companies. So Facebook came out, I was in college and I started a company shortly thereafter. And for the first time in my life, I could use, I could run an ad to you, Tim. I could run an ad to someone in this zip code under this demographic that happens to wear this certain product, which yep. is exactly who I'm looking for. And I was blown away by this as an entrepreneur. And then I looked at Twitter as, oh my goodness, these people have done an amazing job already bringing a market to me. And all yeah. I have to do is be on the platform, use a couple of hashtags, and maybe they'll see exactly what I'm trying to sell. Yeah. And this is always how I viewed it. So I don't know if that's a creator mindset or just an entrepreneur mindset. And then all of a sudden the election's happening between Hillary and Trump. And on my feed for six months is just Hillary stuff, right? And it's maybe of where I went to school and who my friends are. And I'm just like, this is shocking. Like not even on Fox News or on CNN am I seeing one side. It was really strange to me that I was not seeing anything about Trump. And I think this is where people really believe that the election was gonna be a landslide. Uh, election day happens and Trump wins. And half of my office is crying in San Francisco on 9th Street. They're like, and I'm like, wow, people are really convinced, they were really convinced that, you know, this is going to win. And that's when, to me, all the red, like all, everything went off. And this isn't really Russian collusion. It's not that. For me, what went off was we're not seeing the whole picture. And it's because the algorithm is designed in, in some way that way. I don't mm -hmm. know the specifics, but that was for me the moment. And look, I don't need to get political. I really didn't care who won. I never, a president really never did anything for me on either side, or I just never cared that much. But when I saw my employees crying, I was like, this is a big problem. I wonder what's going to happen. And here I was like, just like you, right? In, in Silicon Valley trying to grapple with this. And it was almost like the way I view it, the social media company, specifically Facebook, was all of a sudden like, we were at recess, we were having a great time. And then Donald decided to grab the ball and throw it on the roof. And we were all playing with the ball and everything was fine. But now we didn't like what he did using the rules that were allotted to him. And now it's like, is that really the issue? Is what's the, what are we really upset about? There's a lot there, I realize that, but that's just giving you a window into like how I've interpreted social media. And I think that is because of that, I'm, I, I feel removed from the realities of it and I'm trying to better understand um, the realities of it. As it relates to, to your experience, obviously you guys, I would imagine you're, when you were there anyway, are creating a product really for the consumer to be consumed. And was it always a linear path to doing the advertisements? Was it always like, hey, if we make a platform and we find out the most about people, then the advertisers win? Was that always linear? Or, because I can't imagine that being a linear thought, but I don't know. And by linear, you just mean that it was sort of naturally where we thought we would all end up. Yeah. Like, hey, you've got this, you got a web. I mean, basically what we had on our hands and, and when I joined was a college website for, you know, about 5 million college kids. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and by the way, it had engagement that no one had ever really seen. You had, you know, you had 5 million people on it, 6 million people on it, and half of them were coming back every day. Mm -hmm. And no one in, in um, this is pre smartphone. No one had seen engagement like that before. You didn't have mm. services where people, half the users came back every day. Maybe once a month, half of the users came back. So uh, it was clear that it was really engaging. It was clear that it could be bigger in that, you know, this seemed like a service that other people could use. Look, they had done it with Friendster. They had done it with, with MySpace. Mm -hmm. What Facebook figured out was... The biggest breakthrough of Facebook, in addition to building a terrific product, was that they got lucky by virtue of starting in college and drafting off of the .edu email sign-up process. Because by virtue of drafting off of the, you know, everybody had to have a .edu email to sign up. Yeah. And so the first 10 million people that signed up for Facebook 
were who they said they were hmm. because there was no alternative. You couldn't create a fake account hmm. because wherever you went to school had a clearinghouse for one person gets one email address and it's consistent with what their real name is. Right. And Facebook drafted off all of that. So verifiable and authentic identity was inherent in the first 10 million users. And I think that norm just persisted as the service grew. That's more of an aside about why Facebook, in my opinion, won over the other services and became so dominant. And then look, there were very good people there and they executed very well and they continued to make the product, one word for it is better, another word for it is addictive. But they just kept adding feature after feature after feature that added utility to people's life for sure. But also, and I don't think this was the express intent of me or the people there, but also these features triggered and, and played on our base instincts, right? I mean, status yes. updates and photo tagging and all of that, that plays on vanity and voyeurism and popularity and comparison. Yeah. So that was certainly the, the, the playbook there. When I showed up in 2006, my mandate was as the director of monetization was, hey, figure out how we're going to make a sustainable business here. Mm -hmm. So we tried a bunch of things and advertising was far and away the most uh, straightforward. And the, the context there, everyone else who's, who has a web business at the time is making money off of advertising. Google, Yahoo, MySpace, right. et cetera. Right. So it just was sort of the natural, it, it seemed like the natural conclusion and we were attracting so much user attention and it seemed like, look, we can turn that user attention into money. And that was, that ended up proving out to be true in spades. Yeah. Which I loved as a, you know, early entrepreneur, it was like the best place on earth to, you're going to run ads anyway, right? Like you're already doing it. You're going to, you have the platforms. At what point for you personally did, did like you start to think, Oh man, maybe we're building a beast. Uh, you know, maybe we're building something that isn't, isn't working. I think for the world, including myself, it might've been the election. I don't know if that's true. I don't know if for you, maybe you said, I, I'm sure you picked up on it much sooner, but do you have a, a, a remembrance or a time frame and when you thought, mm, not sure about this? I think I started to have doubt around the election. Okay. Um, so I was sort of right there with you. Yeah. Um, I still you know, was pretty vocal that I didn't think the business model was the fundamental problem with how the company was set up and, 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 and the whole dynamic with users and advertisers and, and then the company. But I, I think by virtue of, you know, working with uh, the filmmakers uh, for The Social Dilemma and working on Moment, my view shifted. Okay. And I fundamentally now believe that if you put together a advertising based business model with all knowing technology that can stitch together the most riveting feed of content that will trigger every single base emotion that you have and mm -hmm. keep you coming back for more. If you pair those things, right? All-knowing mm -hmm. technology that can trigger every emotion, knows you better than you know yourself with the advertising business model, you end up in a bad place mm. because you end up with a service that will keep taking and taking and taking and ultimately manipulating and manipulating and manipulating until, until we're at war with each other. I never thought of the human condition as fixed until you just gave me that example right? It's, it's not the human that's evolving in this matrix. It's the human is the fixed variable in this equation. And so everything, <laughs> which is, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's kind of depressing in some way, but also, yeah, yeah. I guess that's the realization you may have had at one point. Yeah. And I, I, uh, and that's what, that's what I'm scared about, you know, and this, this is the, when you watch 
movies like The Terminator and you see these artificial intelligence robots that basically turn on us. Mm. That's always our conception of what Elon Musk warns us about. Yeah. But it, it doesn't look like that. It looks like what's happening right now. Yeah, it's happening. It's just, it's just under the covers and, you know, it's subterranean. And, you know, you talked about it when you explained your experience of the election, right? We're not all seeing a complete picture of reality. In fact, I would argue some of us are seeing completely distorted versions of reality. And it's, it's unfortunately, these algorithms are becoming incredibly um, adept at dividing us. Not because Mark and Cheryl are saying, hey, divide the country. Right. And make more money. Right. But because that is what it's fundamentally, it's designing itself to do that because that's the best way to drive the most engagement. Yeah. I won't ask you for a fix because it, I don't know that there is one. It, it's something that I've seen. And I think COVID has also made it more clear. There's so many I people, agree. right? Everyone has an opinion on COVID now. Should we weren't, no one's listening to science anymore. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, I, but I also think we just do such a bad job. It, I, I had a meeting yesterday and somebody said, so what do you think of this COVID thing? And I'm like, honestly, here's what I think. I think, I think this is like, it's like 1985 and someone gave us a smartphone and we, instead of accepting that we might not know the whole detail of this thing yet, we're like hitting it and it's doing things. And then it rings at certain times and we're like, oh, we figured it out. We have to wear, like I was wearing a mask. And so therefore correlation equals cause it, you know, it's like this whole, it's like really messed up. And so now we have multiple, multiple opinions. The tests weren't accurate and that's just part, part of what it is. But at the same time, we were able to map its genome in like a month, which we would have never been able to do 50 years ago or 60 years ago. And so people just live in these worlds of like absolutes, into it, but some of these problems yeah. are inherently not, they're just not, it doesn't work that way. Yeah, I think that's right. I was at a building, real estate development, and uh, we had the LAPD come and because we heard there was drug activity inside. And so anyway, sidebar. So I'm talking to the police officer and I'm asking him like, what is this like for you? And he, you know, this time, given BLM and given the, the whole media almost is like turning its back on the entire police force, not, not the bad ones as, as uh, depicted on the media, but just like the entire police force. And he was telling me, you know, he's walking down the street and he has a son himself, a four-year-old son. He sees a little kid and he says hello and the kid flicks him off. And then the mother tells the kid not to look at the officer, like doesn't say don't flick him off. And he was, he was telling me like, this is what we deal with every single day now. And it's just like, I don't know what Facebook does. I know obviously there, it's not just social media here. There's a whole lot to blame, but it feels like social media has the ability to just add a tremendous amount of fire so quickly. And journalism has gone out the window. And, and the truth is, is a, is a, frankly, like whatever you want it to be at this stage. I don't, you know, you can believe whatever yeah. you want and you'll find supporting documents. I always thought a long time ago that I don't know if I thought like, what if Facebook could blockchain news, right? What if we could create truth somehow and Facebook could be the purveyor of that? And obviously that's extremely difficult. And I don't even know. I kind of did some research on how do we do this, but it, it seemed incredibly imp difficult and time consuming. Do you think as a platform, they have any, like any of these social media outlets have any, I don't even want to say like, obviously not responsibility, but maybe that to scrub for truth. I, I think they do. Okay. That's good to know. I mean, I think that, I think they don't think they do. They think that, They don't want to be the arbiters of truth. Right. So essentially what they do is they say, we're not going to be the arbiters of truth, but we will take down content that incites violence directly. But there's a lot of hateful content on there that stays up. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of distorted information on there that stays on there. And they have, in a couple of cases, taken a scalpel 
and said, well, let's actually take this out. For instance, I think they've done a decent job with COVID because they not maybe not an excellent job, but a decent job because sure. the consequences were grave if you know the notion that Lysol was a viable treatment got propagated. Right. So they they sort of convinced themselves that it was in the public interest to get rid of that misinform that medical misinformation. And so they did it, mm -hmm. which is interesting for interesting in my mind because it means that they can do it if they want to. For all the other content though that remains, they leave it and say it's free speech. We don't want to be the arbiters of truth. The problem with that, in my opinion, is that then the algorithm becomes the arbiter of truth mm. somewhat blindly. And it shows you your echo chamber of right. facts and information and it shows someone else a different set of facts and information based on what will create the most engagement it's not maximizing right or truth right it's maximizing for engagement and if we just showed everybody the same set of facts and and op and, and optimize for truth we actually would likely see a big decline in engagement and I think that's where the rub is. And oh, by the way, that's where the misalignment is between, in my opinion, the business model of advertising and having a social media service. I think it leads to ultimately bad outcomes. It, it does in some way to me though, especially in recent times, it feels like the social media outlets are starting to understand that they, I don't want to say they have to pick a side, but it's starting to feel like as there's like, it, like the censorship is becoming a snowball, right? There's the, uh, it inflicts harm. Okay. Well, let's talk about all these things that might may or may not inflict immediate harm. And now that becomes an opinion. And now that snowball can only grow from this moment because it's almost like COVID like right now, restaurants can be open, but a brewery cannot. And it's like, what's the difference? <laughs> it's, it's really, they're in a, I'm frustrated with the company because I think they've been negligent mm. in terms of not staying ahead of this and these problems. But I also have compassion for the difficulty of the problem yeah. that is now sitting squarely on their lap. It's tough. I mean, they will be, if this election goes sideways, it will be, the blame will be placed on them. Fair or not. Right. Any, any predictions for the election coming up here? <laughs> it's, it's a who knows for me. Yeah. <laughs> Based on how the last one went. It's a who knows for me too. I have no idea. Not my, not my <laughs> area of expertise in terms of predicting, predicting what's going to happen. The only thing that bums me out about Facebook presently and even Instagram is we, we had um, the district attorney who's running for Los Angeles on the podcast and we talked to him shortly. At, you know, he's, he's progressive and he used to be the San Francisco district attorney actually. And now he's running here in LA and he's viewed as progressive, which is an interesting word. I wouldn't put progressive on him. He just seems like he's a human. Um, but you know, the media labels his, uh, him as progressive and he's trying to give away or not give away, but do away with a lot of these incarcerations as, as it relates to marijuana and um, attacking more of like mental health and, and trying to help, which all makes very logical Great. sense in my head. Yeah, absolutely. So, so we do this podcast and I just tried to put ads on it uh, on Instagram to get the word out here in LA and it's blocked. And nothing about it is me endorsing this candidate. It's just getting his, you know, his talking points out into the public. And it wasn't like, I was like, oh, amazing. I agree. So cool. It wasn't that. And it was just like this, the censorship, right? It, it goes back to the censorship. What did you did you, they didn't provide a reason. They basically, well, no, they didn't. And, and I appealed it a few times and then I just kind of gave up um, and called it what it was. I was like, oh, I get it. Right. I guess I understand it. They asked for a license and then for me to like register as an affiliate, like a political affiliate or something. And that's just not me or the podcast. So it didn't, didn't, I was like, I don't need to go through the six week process just to find yeah. out, you yeah. know, just for this one yeah. episode. But that was a bummer. You know, it's like a bummer. Like you want to share that. And then you, you don't know if because of that, it's just not many people are going to get educated on, let's say, 
that particular candidate. So those kinds of things bum me out. Let's let's talk about MoMA. Let's switch gears to what you're what <laughs> what gets you inspired every day. So I downloaded it. I've been using it for I think two weeks now, basically since the social dilemma. Oddly enough. <laughs> Some of the good things that came out of that movie. So I never had notifications on to begin with, which was great. Yeah. So like, I was like, oh, that's great. I'm, I'm right there. And then I downloaded Moment and I've been using it. I'm sure you get this question all the time. You know, Apple has the product of screen time. To me, that one just seems like it, it doesn't do anything really, right? It just says, hey, here's your activity, which is kind of like the caveman's approach to a problem. It's like, oh, 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 there's a rock and that's it. Yeah. And then it just lets yeah. you handle it. How do you think about you know, what, what your app is doing and, and some of the things you're building to help people get off of social or not, maybe not get off, but just become more aware of the, of how they spend their time. Yeah. Well, the, the, when I think about this problem, which is basically just like phone, you know, us losing control over our phone. Mm -hmm. If you believe you've lost control over your phone, we sort of at moment believe there are three sort of three sequential steps you can take to get control back. And these steps are really embedded in the product. The first is awareness, which is the measurement piece. It's like, understand how much time you stare at your phone all day. And importantly, understand how much time you, how many times you pick it up. Because there's an attention span thing. You, you know, some people don't spend a ton of cumulative time on their phone, but they pick it up you know, they'll pick it up a hundred times. And that fragmenting of your day-to-day -day life makes people feel bad. And people are always surprised by how many times they pick it up every day. And they're also very surprised by how much time they spend on it. So, you know, the average user spends, the average person in the United States spend four hours a day on their smartphone. If you ask those people how long they think they spend on the phone, it's two hours. Right. <laughs> so just that awareness step can be really helpful in terms of changing your behavior. Uh, the second piece is, you know, just guidelines. Basically, we provide a bunch of guidelines that help people and, and steps that they can take, removing notifications, setting limits on certain apps, that help people really shift and get, get back control. And then the final thing, which is new in, in our most recent version of, of Moment, is we think that real behavior change, and, and this bears out in, in a lot of the scientific research, happens when groups of people co-commit mm -hmm. and groups of people hold each other accountable. So you can create different groups on Moment of your friends or people that you're, you know, your family. And, and then the service basically allows you each to see the other screen time and pickups. And that, just that basic leaderboard concept can really help people uh, develop much better sense of how they're doing and a sense of kind of accountability and transparency with the people around them. And so that's, it's, it's really basic at, at the moment, the app, but it's really based on those principles, awareness, guides, and, and then group, I'll call it group accountability, group transparency. Do, do you ever think of, so one thing I'm always, so I haven't had a television in like six years and now there's one behind me uh, because of COVID, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. yeah. So the good news is we were able to watch The Social Dilemma in HD. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the bad news is uh, I, I love not having a television because I yeah. read a, stati a stat that's like the average American, at least the TV's on for like 13 hours a day. Whether they're watching it or not is a different story, but let's pretend they're watching it. For yeah, no, TV usage is pretty high still. It's amazing. It's, it's amazing. And so yeah. I love not having it because if people came over, yeah. friends came over, we would just turn music on and then yeah. talk like we would have a yeah. conversation, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is almost like, and they'd come over like, oh, this is so nice. We just talk. And I'm like, yeah. what, are you, what are we, where has the world gone? Do you ever yeah. think about integrating with other platforms, whether it's smart TVs or just, so just to give someone like a holistic view on yeah, no, we've we've certainly thought about that. I mean, we got to we're, we're not very big as a company. So, sure. you know, I can see that down the line for sure. The other things that we are working on just in terms of problem spaces, there's one other big one, uh, which I call sort of social health. And 
the point of this category, if you will, is that, you know, because of these phones, we spend a shitload of time scrolling through a feed of things that actually don't matter to us, including people who don't really matter to us. Yeah. Friend 745 <laughs> is not very interesting to me. Right. But what that does is it actually pulls time away from time that I used to have to maintain and nurture the relationships that really mattered to me. Mm -hmm. And so our social health is deteriorating as a result of that. And so we fundamentally believe that there are going to be services and we're building and prototyping these services today that are going, that people are going to pay for that are going to help them in lieu of scrolling through a feed for three hours at night, instead have people spend some of that time focusing on nurturing and developing the relationships that matter the most to them. I'm sure when you talk to some people, obviously you've done a lot of interviews, they think that's crazy, right? They're like, what is he talking about? On the reverse of that, do you feel like you're, you're the first mover in some, to some extent? Like, do you feel the complete reverse of that where there's going to be more Tim Kendall's? There's going to be like, the, you're just the beginning and there's going to be four or five moments coming out here in the next two years. I mean, how do you, because <laughs> I could see either or, right? Yeah. I mean, I feel, what, what do I think? There's some days... Look, this is like any entrepreneur. There's some days I'm like, I'm the first mover. I <laughs> see something that other people don't. And then yeah, that's terrifying. there are other days where I think I am totally seeing the world wrong. Mm. And no one is going to care about this service. No one wants this service. And, you know, I'm not selling a Hershey bar. I'm selling a really a gluten-free, <laughs> dairy-free granola bar. Right. right. That people want to eat if they really understand the impact of, of eating 20 Hershey bars a day. So, you know, I, I, I do think that just to finish on the social health piece, the whole idea is, hey, we're so deliberate about what we eat. We're so deliberate about, you know, now our sleep, our mindfulness, our meditation, our exercise regime the biggest driver of how long you're going to live and how long you're going to evade disease and how happy you're going to characterize your life is the quality of your closest relationships. Mm. But I leave it to chance. That's crazy. That's crazy for sure. You, you could even market it like social obesity is a yeah. next pandemic, yeah. I mean, right? <laughs> yeah. And, and people do, to your earlier question, people do hear what I just said and they think I'm crazy. Right. And my follow-up question to them is, well, who are your closest friends? And they, they think about it. And I said, well, when's the last time you talked to them? Right. And that's usually the, the eye-opener is – Oh, yeah. And COVID has changed that a little bit, probably for the better, mm. maybe, in that I actually think that strangely, some people are closer to their closest friends because it's, it's opened up time and space for us to talk more and Zoom more and do those sorts of things. But yeah. in general, we don't spend that much time nurturing the relationships with the people that are closest to us, apart from maybe our family. That's very true. I, it's my brain goes in so many different directions as I'm talking to you because as a creator, social media is like our best, our biggest thing, right? And then I think about helping Tim, and I go, I, I so Paris Hilton, who's now like a, a speaker, right, and talks about how she was addicted to social media, and literally her followers became her friends, became her family, and yep. without that that engagement, she felt empty. Yeah. And then I think about, oh, Tim should hook up and you know link up with Paris and. Yeah a bunch of these people who know, who know the end game, right? Who know how bad it at Taylor Swift, who know how ugly it gets. Yeah. And, and go on the record and say, look, yeah. what Tim is talking about is cause, cause then you have the reverse of like Gary Vee, who you know, famously says, Oh, you just sound like the guy that was upset about Elvis shaking his hips in the fifties. And now, yeah. you know, it's like, yeah. Oh, 
I don't think that's true either. It's like, yeah. there's, there's something here in the middle. As a parent, I don't know how old your daughters are, but as a parent, what do you do with phones? Do you say no phone until this age or what? what and I'm sure this is a difficult one. But what, what is that like for you? What decisions have you and your wife made? Yeah, we, we've been, I mean, when you have a four and a six-year-old, really, you're only just, you're making really decisions about whether you let them watch shows or not. I suppose there's some pe- some families that are doing, letting them do interactive things like that. But we're basically at that stage, we're like, do you let them watch Mr. Roger replays or do you let them do that? And, and we do it very sparingly mainly because we've done trial and error. And when they watch a bunch of shows, Hmm. they act like monsters. (laughs) And when they don't, they're really pleasant and they're more creative and they have longer attention spans. Yeah. So that's just, that's just been our experience. When when they get older, you know, there's a, a model called wait till eight that basically is a is a framework that parents at the same where their kids are in school can say hey first grade parents do you all want to sign this pledge that says we're we're going to wait till eighth grade or when the kid is 13 or 14 to give them a smartphone and let them sign up for social media because if we can all band together and agree to that right we're probably going to be making a pretty amazing choice on their behalf Hmm. And so I, I would like to try to do that with each of my daughter's classes. And then I think the final thing that I think parents get wrong on this issue is that whenever they complain to me about how much their kids use their phones, they don't want to talk about how much they use their phones. Hmm. They don't want to look at their own usage. And modeling is everything in, in my view. I have this funny stat that, you know, if you ask parents, 80% of parents think wearing a helmet when you ride a bike is critical, but only 25% actually do it themselves. Mm -hmm. And so only 40% of kids wear helmets on bikes. Mm -hmm. Conversely, you look at seatbelts, you know, almost 100% of people think seatbelts are important. Adults wear them and kids wear them. We're sort of all in alignment on that. Right. I think with smartphone usage, if, you, if, if your family wants to change, it's got, you got to change as a unit. And, you know, I've talked to, you know, doctors who treat families where the kids are diabetic. And the only way that you can sustainably really get your kid in that circumstance to stop eating, to, to change their lifestyle in terms of how they eat, is the whole family has to change. Right. It, it just does not work when they don't. And so I think parents who are really serious about this have to have a reckoning with their own usage. And a lot don't want to do that. Yeah. Which to me <laughs> underscores how serious the problem is. Yeah, There's that's like, super valid. Addiction. Guess, guess what one of the fundamental issues is in addiction? Denial. Right. Lack of awareness. Right. Just, just to kind of, let's cherry on top of this. What are some of the myths people definitely get wrong and the data just shows completely the other way? Like what are, you know, we, we've sort of peppered around this, but if you could just succinctly tell us one to three things that people for sure have it a hundred percent wrong. Well, I mentioned this earlier, but I'll mention it again. People are off by a factor of two in terms of how much time they spend. Yeah. And I always think it's interesting to frame it in terms of percentage of time in your life, meaning you're awake 16 hours a day. If you're spending four hours on the phone, you're spending a quarter of your life looking at your smartphone. Hmm. Oh, this one's an interesting one, which is that, you know, we've got in our in terms of our guides in the Moment app, we can see how effective they are by age and other demographics. And it turns out that 20 and 30 somethings are much more coachable than, you know, 40, 50 year olds. Interesting. They're they're just, they're just in, you know, and you would think, right, that maybe the wisdom and maturity that comes with age would make (laughs) you sort of more willing to shift and change. But what we learn is that 20 and 30 somethings, that youth 
comes with a malleability around habits. It's cool to see it, actually. That is really cool. That's that's like help, that's a hopeful data, right? Absolutely. That's the future. These are future voters of the yeah. future leaders of the world. Yeah, absolutely. Any advice for creators that really leverage these social media outlets to get their message out, whether it's art, whether it's podcasts, whatever it is. And I, this is a little selfish question for me too. Yeah, well, because look, I mean, this is, I'd say one of the lenses that I do think is interesting is that the zeitgeist around this is starting to come into, you know, clear focus. The zeitgeist around this notion that we're, we're addicted to these things. Mm -hmm. And you, I've started to see companies, and I think this applies to creators too, drafting off of that. So Carnival Cruise Lines ran an ad campaign for months that mm -hmm. basically marketed the cruise as a time to basically unplug to take a break from your phone with your family. So as you know, things like the social dilemma and others make this part of the zeitgeist, if creators and their products are aligned with that, I think it's a, I think it's a societal shift that they can draft off of. That makes a lot of sense. You know, I think that Gary V is always talking about TikTok, pay attention to TikTok. And by the way, that seems like really sound advice. Um, that platform is scary in that it is riveting. Yes. And so if I were a creator, I would be really going deep on trying to understand the, the dynamics because it's, it's just like Instagram was so different from Facebook and Snap is, is really different from Instagram. TikTok is, all, is, its, own, is its own thing. Yeah. That's fair. I love what you said though. I mean, something that, you know, we can close on this too. It's, it's really just take, take, take responsibility for yourself, right? It starts with you. And that, that sounds yeah. so obvious. And I think people get that as it relates to their diet, just like you said, an exercise. Yeah. And this in climate change, I think that was, you know, when inconvenient truth came out, you know, that out war movie, I think yeah, yeah, yeah. one of the great, one of the wonderful things about that movie in, in my recollection, at least was that I do think there was this awareness about, you know, leaving lights on and leaving my air conditioner on all day. And, and do I need three SUVs? And maybe I should be just a little bit more mindful about recycling versus regular trash. And that's a, look, I, I think that shifted hearts and minds. I think the personal responsibility part of that helped shift hearts and minds. Yeah. And I, I have a similar hope with our phones and our relationship with them. Well, I certainly think you're right. I mean, I'll say that much. I think you're the way I view you, and, and this is probably just as a hope for humanity too, is, is you're right. I think you're a first mover. I'm hoping a lot of people follow. I'm hoping the social dilemma might have a chapter two, three, and four that we can focus in on. Maybe the story gets better. Yeah. You're right. Maybe the human race is just declining, yeah. but at least yeah. we know, right? And I think the, to your point, awareness is the first step. Yeah. Tim, where can people find you? Tell us all the social media channels that they can jump yeah. on to find you. <laughs> well, the best, the best place to find us is in the moment.io or moment.io. And in the it's, app store. Yeah, and that's and in the app store, we're there as well, uh, just under moment. If you go to in the moment.io, you'll see some of the other projects that we're working on, uh, including some of that social health uh, stuff that I referred to. I think you got to double down on that social health, social obesity. I think we got to start making a lot of terms, get Paris like Hilton it. on board. I think, I mean, I would, what choice do we have, right? If, if you're already in the deep end, you might as well just, you're, I'm with you. <laughs> yeah. I'm with you. Well, thanks like for coming on the podcast. Confidence. Yeah. Thank yeah. you very much. I Diego. appreciate it. This is yeah. fun.